this Human Services at QVCC webinar, um, which is an introduction to reproductive rights. My name is Shelley Bookbinder. I'm an assistant professor of human services at QVCC, and I'm joined by my colleague, James Tebow, who is a reference and instruction librarian at QVCC. This topic um, is situated in Women's History Month and the desire to talk about reproductive rights in light of the changes that have been happening due to the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization um, overturning of Roe v. Wade last year, um, discussions about um, restricting access to hormonal birth control. So all these discussions around rights around reproduction um, made it um, feel really prescient to talk about the history of reproductive rights and to think about um, some of the ways in which rights have been historically limited, some expansions and then contractions again since the 1980s. Um, so again, this is part of a project that James and I worked on to create a library guide on this um, that we'll show you and give you access to at the end of this presentation. Um, but um, I hope that this is, is valuable and timely. I'd also like to mention that um, we're going to be talking about women's rights, um, a lot about women, but that doesn't really encompass all people who can be pregnant or give birth. Um, there are people who are trans and non-binary um, women who um, identify as women but can't be pregnant or give birth, and people who don't identify as women who um, uh, can be pregnant and give birth. And so um, we try to, I try as much as I can to be inclusive. The guide is not inclusive in all the ways that it can be, um, which I'm going to try to rectify over time. So I just wanted to acknowledge that before we get started. So this is a brief one hour webinar and um, it has three very simple objectives. So the first is that at the end of this webinar, you'll be able to identify reproductive rights, um, what they are, why they're important, to identify expanded reproductive rights since the 1970s to the present, um, but then identify challenges to reproductive rights, as I mentioned, that have been going on since the 1980s. And before we get into um, the core of what we're going to be talking about, I wanted to just mention um, the distinction between reproductive health and reproductive rights, since we're focusing on reproductive rights. Um, so reproductive health um, oftentimes talks about well-being in terms of sexual well-beings. So that could be access to um, information about STIs, ways to limit STIs, um, information about consent, um, then the reproductive system, so thinking about um, things like preventative checks, screenings, um, any type of, of kind of wellness around the reproductive system, so more healthcare based. But reproductive rights are rights to have or not have children. Um, and so this could mean access to contraception and abortion, things to limit um, the ability of have, limit having children, but they could also be um, safe environments to birth and raise children, things like prenatal care. So that would basically allow for safe pregnancy. And I think sometimes we just focus on contraception and abortion, which is very important, but there's also rights around the ability to safely have children. So we're going to start a little bit in history. As I mentioned, um, the impetus for the guide was Women's History Month. And so um, I'm just going to give an overview of um, historically limited reproductive control um, and then go into some specifics about that in a moment. So there is a history of limits to reproductive control, both for, both for people to be forced to be pregnant, and this is to some degree through a lack of access to contraception, um, rape, but then also for sterilization. And sterilization is removing someone's ability to, um, to make someone pregnant, to be pregnant themselves. And so there's a history of both forcing people to be pregnant and to not be pregnant. There's also been a history for once people are pregnant, um, forced birth, um, so limiting someone's ability to terminate pregnancy, um, but then also forced termination. Um, and there are a number of total institutions that have heavily pressured or forced termination of pregnancies, everything from um, state psychiatric hospitals to prisons um, to the military. And so depending on people, depending on the situation, there's been a lot of coercion where a lot of women, a lot of people who can be pregnant did not have a lot of say over their reproduction. 
And so just think about, right, have you heard of any of these limits, um, forced sterilization, forced termination? Are these things that you, you learned about? Because I'll just say um, I didn't learn about these things um, in my primary, secondary education and really even my college education. It's not things that are really talked about that much, which is why we wanted to shine a light on this. So just take a moment to, to think about that. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're gonna go into two sides of this. Um, some people being forced to be pregnant, and then I'm gonna take the other side. Some people have been forced to not be pregnant. And so to begin, people being forced to be pregnant. Um, there's a long history of this, and some of it continues still, um, where rape is, is pretty common. It's a common experience among women in this country. About a third of women um, report that they have been raped um, in their lifetime. Um, for sexual assault, that goes up to over 50%. There's a lot of discussions that those are underreported. Um, most people um, that assault people are acquaintances, friends, or in fact, partners or spouses. Um, and in fact, in this country until 1976, there was a marital rape exception in the entire United States where there was no way to bring up a husband on a charge of rape of a wife or vice versa. Um, and so um, this was an exception until 1993, um, right? So it's only been about um, 30 years since there's been an exception for marital, there hasn't been a marital rape exception. Um, and so um, rape-related pregnancies, either in marriage or not in marriage, um, there are right now an estimated 3 million people that have had rape-related pregnancies in the United States. Um, and so it's a relative, and that might be right under reporting, especially if you have marital rape. There are stats that say marital rape is still as high as 10% of marriages include rape. And that doesn't really include coercion, right? Of feeling coerced into having sex. And so the rates are probably higher than that. Um, and so some of these are in the course of marriages. Some are from acquaintance rape or date rape. Um, and so um, this is a relatively common experience. Um, and I'll have a video on this in a moment with a little more detail. Um, so this kind of sexual coercion, whether it's rape, whether it's pressure, um, can lead to forced pregnancy. And this is in part because um, birth control, hormonal birth control that women could control, um, was illegal um, for most women until 1972. And abortion was highly limited, often to wealthy women um, who could have um, private um, obstetricians and gynecologists who would perform abortions. But for most women, um, it was highly limited um, and illegal. And so to stop or terminate a pregnancy had legal consequences, right, for violating um, bans on abortion or bans on um, birth control access, um, and then also health consequences for trying to get um, either birth control or abortions that were not legal. And a lot of people were kind of swindlers and doing things that were dangerous. And so I want to share um, a quick video um, on rape um, because we don't really talk about um, rape and rape related pregnancy. And so this is a resource. It's a little bit dated, um, but I think it has great information. It's about a minute um, on rape related pregnancy. From the White House doctor, Connie Mariano, with this her health minute. Despite crazy comments by some politicians, we're here to share with you Every two minutes in the U.S. alone, someone is sexually assaulted. According to Planned Parenthood, more than 5% of all rapes result in more than 22,000 unwanted pregnancies a year prevented. So what exactly are we talking about? Rape is defined as forced vaginal, anal, or oral Ejaculation to vaginal or even anal result in pregnancy. Oral intercourse alone, forced or consensual, cannot lead to rape. According to Lane, the rape of the National Network, 2004 to 2005, more than 64,000 women were raped. According to medical statistics, there is a 5% chance of pregnancy following just one incident of intercourse. Do the math, 5% of 64,000 comes out to more than 3,000 pregnancies in 2004 alone due to rape. So yes, it is very possible to become pregnant and rape. Dr. Connie Mariano for Empower Her. To ask her experts any health-related 
Okay. Um, and I think, um, you know, people don't often think about, we talk about sexual assault, but we don't often talk about what happens. Um, most of the time, contraception is not used in forced sexual contact. Um, there's not a lot of control that the person being raped um, has. And so it is important to think about kind of what happens, especially um, as there are restrictions on um, termination that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Or for more information. Hmm. Sorry. And so think about, right, have you heard of rape-related pregnancy and its impact? Because um, this is something that um, there's been a lot of really great reporting on, for example, people who um, go to term, especially in states now that have abortion restrictions, and issues around child support and having somebody, right, who knows where you live um, if you if you go for child support or they can they can ask for visitation rights. So this is a really evolving thing, especially as more people are going to go to term in states that don't allow for abortion or termination. So at the same time, so you have this history where some people have been forced to be pregnant, had very limited way to restrict pregnancy through contraception um, or abortion. There's a whole other side of this where some people are forced to not be pregnant. And so um, there was a movement in the United States um, that actually came out of strangely um, animal breeding um, called eugenics um, that was quite popular um, with policies and programs from around the 1890s to the 1940s. Um, and these um, eugenic policies and programs were focused on quote unquote racial improvement through planned breeding. And that's why it kind of relates to animal husbandry. We talk about breeding of dogs, breeding of cattle, things like that. And so the idea was um, that humans could plan breeding to, to breed better traits. Um, and this ended up being completely scientifically um, discredited um, and seen as scientific racism. Um, and this, in fact, a lot of these policies of determining who should you know, breed with each other, racial purity ideas, who's deemed as unfit um, to give birth was very influential in Nazi policy. Um, and Hitler um, at different points um, said that he was in debt to like US eugenicists. Um, and I have a book that's cited here by Edwin Black um, specifically about the war, called The War Against the Weak about um, eugenics and um, in its influence on the Nazis. Um, and part of the reason eugenics policies start to decline is because um, then Nazis' use of it made it incredibly unpopular in the mid-1940s. So eugenic programs, however, span the 20th century, and their goal is to limit quote-unquote unfit people's pregnancies um, with the idea that in order to have greater racial purity and kind of stock in the population, that um, certain people should not be allowed to have children or should be discouraged. Um, and some of the examples of these policies um, were birth control um, through Planned Parenthood. Very famously, um, the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, um, was in favor of eugenic policies and wanted to see a decrease in immigrant um, pregnancies and births. And that was some of the impetus for the founding of Planned Parenthood, which they talked quite a bit about and how it's a very difficult history that it's important to, to think about because a lot of people feel very negatively about Planned Parenthood, um, fearing that um, there's still kind of eugenic um, elements to it. There's also um, forcible sterilization, um, which was legalized in the 1927 Buck versus Bell Supreme Court decision. Um, this has never been overturned, so it's technically still legal to forcibly sterilize somebody under Buck v. Bell. Um, and a tens of thousands of people across the country, mostly in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, were forcibly sterilized. Um, however, there is still sterilization that happens, but it's mostly in, um, in for incarcerated people. Um, there were people incarcerated in California in the last five years, right? So this still happens. It's in much smaller um, numbers, um, but um, this is a, a kind of on the books policy. And then child um, uh, welfare child caps. And these are welfare policies since the 1996 welfare reform um, TANF which basically put caps on the amount of welfare you could receive. So in some cases, it would reduce your welfare amount if you had more children, or it would cap you so that if you had more children, the amount that you would receive would decrease with the idea that it was better for people receiving cash assistance to not have more children and to use um, sticks in order to have that. So it's a different type of eugenics policy than sterilization. Um, there were also some um, forced nor plant that we have some resources on, which is a long-term birth control that were court ordered. So a lot of different policies. Now the question is, right, 
what does it mean to be unfit, right? Unfit to bear children, unfit to reproduce. Um, and this definition has been very highly racialized. Um, and um, with Buck v. Bell, the rate of black women versus white women being sterilized was three to one. And so thinking about, right, what it means to be unfit, a lot of the people, the rationale was that people were feeble-minded. Um, so there was no real definition, but this idea of an intersection of poverty, an intersection of race, and an intersection of disability were really strongly used by eugenicists to claim that certain people should not have children. Um, and this is, again, in programs, in rhetoric, and I want you to think about, right, have you witnessed any eugenic programs or arguments? The idea that it is bad for certain people to have children, that certain people are unfit, that it is a drain on the population. Um, there's some of this, um, and we have some of this in the library guide, around immigrants having children, specifically um, people who are undocumented, this idea of anchor babies, of trying to reduce the number of children that people are having. Um, so some of this is embedded in some of the discussion around different populations. Um, but as I said, eugenics is like 1980s to the 1940s, um, but it's absolutely still embedded in a lot of our discussion around immigrants, around people receiving welfare. So it's something to, to keep in mind. So now I want to shift to that was kind of limited ability to control reproduction, to have, to not have children. Um, and then there's a break that happens starting in the 1960s and accelerating into the 1970s um, in terms of the civil rights movements of that era. There's a women's rights movement, um, which is very influential in doing um, a couple of things we'll talk about. So it in, um, there's an increase in sex education, a legalization of the pill or hormonal birth control, which was really kind of groundbreaking in terms of um, women being able to control um, reproduction, legalization of abortion, and then an increase in obstetrics and gynecology and hospital-based births in the 1960, which really makes childbirth much, much safer for both um, pregnant women and um, fetuses and newborn children. And so for each of these, I'll just talk about some, and there's some resources embedded in here. Um, so something that's very influential, and, um, James will talk about this more in a moment, um, in, increase in sex education, um, there's the Sexual Information and Education Council of the United States, um, which is a large public interest organization called CECAS, um, is founded in 1964, and they do a number of educational and lobbying um, initiatives on the state level. And again, we'll talk about them more in a moment. Um, there's legalization of hormonal birth control. Um, this is first for married couples in 1965 with the Supreme Court case Griswold versus Connecticut. Very good job, Connecticut. Um, and in 1972, um, for all, so you don't have to be married in order to access hormonal birth control, and that's Eisenstadt versus Bard, another Supreme Court decision. So lots of really influential Supreme Court decisions um, are helping to secure some rights. There's also the legalization nationally of abortion in 1973 um, with the Roe versus Wade decision, um, which has just recently been overturned in 2022. Um, it's very important to note um, that most people who um, get abortions in this country already have children. I think 61% of people who get abortions already have children. Um, about 25% of those people already have one child. Um, and, you know, the other 30 plus percent have more than one child already. Um, and so the discussion of kind of kids making mistakes, it's much more, it's a much more compli complicated population. Um, and people who have abortions are more likely to be low income and from historically marginalized communities. It's very important to say um, that it can be very confusing between supporting sometimes for people between eugenics and supporting abortion, but it should be very clear that n that there is no argument here that people should be who are low income or his, from historically marginalized community should have abortions, but it should be an option for people um, because these are also the populations that were targeted very much by eugenic policies. So that should be very clear. We'll talk a little bit more about that case, the overturning later. This is, again, just an overview. And then in terms of an increase in obstetrics and gynecology and hospital-based births, um, there's the creation of community health centers. Some people think of them as federally qualified health clinics. For example, Generations in Putnam and Willimantic is an example of it. Um, they created um, 
they were created in the 1960s and remain centers for obstetrics and gynecology services in pediatrics. Um, so they're often, they accept Medicaid, they accept sliding scale services, so they basically accept everyone. And a lot of people receive um, gynecological, prenatal, um, pediatrics at these places. So incredibly important for maternal and child health. And then um, Medicaid's created in 1965 with Medicare, and it covers um, about 40% of all prenatal care and delivery services. So um, for Medicaid, um, pregnancy is a dis disability. And so um, it covers people who wouldn't normally be covered under Medicaid. So it's incredibly important. It basically catches all the people who are insured um, or are heavily underinsured um, to be able to safely have prenatal care and um, labor and delivery services. So very important. Okay, so I am now going to turn things over to James, who is going to, oh, <laughs> um, so just think about, have you seen any of these, uh, be seen benefits of any of these advancements? So just kind of think about, right, you know, do you use hormonal birth control? You know, have you um, benefited from an increase in comprehensive sex education, um, the legalization of abortion, Medicaid, community-based health centers? I know um, the first place that I, just to be a little personal, the first place that I received any um, gynecological or reproductive health services was at a community-based health clinic in Hartford, Connecticut. So I absolutely benefited from community-based health care um, when I was in high school for some of my early reproductive health care. So just think about like how this benefited you or impacted you. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the social impact of birth control. Now, birth control has been around since pretty much since biblical times. I mean, there's been references of the pullout method, um, but overall, as centuries have passed, birth control has always been mostly ineffective, inconsistent, where you had maybe, for example, with condoms, they might be lined with some sort of animal skin, or you might have ways of which, um, there might be ways of blocking the semen from passing through so, through a variety of methods like cotton or, other questionable methods and needless to say that they're very inconsistent and they wouldn't work. And the other thing is that this would involve two partners where if, you know, take for example, a condom, well, if the male does not want to use a condom, then the whole thing is moot. So what it was so important about the birth control was how incon like how discreet it can be, where a woman can take the pill and not have to worry about being pregnant and not have to worry about their partner kind of choosing not to partake in some sort of method of birth control. Now, uh, you'll see that there's two pictures right there. We have Margaret Sanger, who um, uh, Bookbinder mentioned earlier, who was en ended up finding a, a Planned Parenthood. And then you have Gregory Pindis. Uh, there was also much more people involved in the creation of the birth control, but I also wanted to mention him because he's from my hometown of Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, he was a very, very talented biologist, and uh, he was denied tenure, I want to say, at um, Harvard because he was Jewish. And so he made his own type of laboratory in Worcester, and um, he, there was talks of him working on some sort of birth control. So Margaret Sanger kind of funded his research to develop the birth control. And it was revolutionary. All of a sudden, a woman can make her own decision whether or not she wants to have kids or prolong when she wants to have kids and do it on her own terms and not necessarily with the, um, with the agreement of another person because it's her body and her choice. Is there anything else you want to add with that, Shelley? No, I was going to say, I can tell you're from Worcester by the way you pronounce it. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit more about, but I definitely think that um, there's been discussions about um, production of a uh, a male birth control pill, but really the ability um, to, you know, if somebody doesn't necessarily agree with, because a lot of people say, well, it, these are decisions that should be shared and a lot of reproductive decisions should be shared, but disproportionately um, the consequences, the costs um, of childbirth, of both pregnancy and childbirth fall disproportionately on women and people who can be pregnant. And so the, the thinking about like, an ability to like protect oneself um, from that is very important because again, the disproportionate weight, the weight of pregnancy related discrimination of childcare costs, all those things do fall disproportionately on women. So, okay. Um, so um, 
I want to talk about um, some of the benefits of expanded reproductive access. Um, so basically, since um, the advent of um, hormonal birth control that James just spoke about, which became legal for everyone only in 1972, and also um, national access to um, abortion, which again, based on location, based on cost, never, not everybody could always access abortion easily. Um, but what ended up happening was there's increased education for women, the high school graduation rate increases, um, there's increased workforce participation for women, um, and there's decreased poverty among children. And so all of these are benefits that are seen. Um, and again, the biggest population of people who get abortions are people who already have children. Um, and so it's important to think about um, the ability this has um, for um, education, for work, um, for children's health. So if somebody has one or two children already, being able to have an abortion or control reproduction through contraceptives are allowing people to keep their existing children um, out of poverty. So very important access. And so think about, have you seen any of these benefits? Just, you know, think about have you seen you know increased women in the workplace education like how have you seen this actually at play because it it's really been revolutionary um, for a lot of people um, we also need to factor in that if women are getting pregnant you know the like all of a sudden at 18 19 or even younger birth control allows that chance to kind of prolong the chance of pregnancy so that they can focus on their careers or other sorts of attributions Absolutely. Yeah. But there's also been some wonderful advances because, right, just because people get pregnant doesn't mean um, or has access to contraceptives. Some people want to have children young, don't want to have abortions. Um, you know, it's also important to think about different access to care in terms of, you know, high schools mainstreaming. There used to be pregnancy high schools that people would be pulled out. So thinking about access to daycares, things like that. So it's also important to think about access kind of wherever people's choices are. But yeah, it absolutely can, can add more. And, and like you just said, the keyword choice. Exactly. Um, so there's been some, while those were a lot of amazing advances, there's been some emerging challenges since the 1980s, which um, we're going to kind of bring the presentation to talk about. Um, and we're going to talk about each of these in more depth. So um, absence only sex education has been rising. So I mentioned that CECAS was founded in the 1960s around comprehensive sex education, but um, funding um, and also acts like the Adolescent Family Life Act of 1981 have really pushed funding and support for abstinence-based or even abstinence-only education. Um, and I have to say, I feel like when I was in school, I don't know if it was, abs I think it was abstinence-based because it was very much around delaying not having yeah. So I think that even in Connecticut, depending on where you went to school, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you may have had abstinence based, not absence only education. Um, there also have been state level abortion restrictions and the end of federal abortion rights. Um, and there's also growing maternal health care deserts. So as people are given fewer options, um, it's becoming more dangerous for people to um, to give birth and harder to access services. So I'm going to shift things over to James, who's going to talk a little bit about sex education in the United States. Yeah, um, that's interesting about the abstinence only thing um, for your for your school. I was fortunate enough to have a comprehe sex comprehension education, um, and I think it radically made a difference. So let's actually focus on the differences of the two. Well, before either one of these programs were developed, this was mostly a in-house education, where most people were taught such, a, such education at home. And if it was, it was very skewed towards um, being very conservative and being, you know, not venturing out too much on, on a whole. This really changed a lot during World War I, where all of a sudden a lot of soldiers were getting STIs and there was this urge to start building a comprehensive sex education. So, Essentially, two branches kind of merged out of it. Both both programs that are listed right here are still being funded by the government. And uh, let's start with abstinence only education because I think that was the first one that kind of emerged, which is really heavily based in uh, kind of Christian ideologies, the idea of sex sex until after you're married, and it's really the only acceptable path going forward. So you're delaying until you are married. Now the a lot of the cons behind this is, well, one, what if you're never planning on getting married? 
So does that mean you can never have sex? And it also does a lot of sidestepping with types of like masturbation, orientation, abortion. It really talks about contraceptions because, well, if you're going to have sex when you're after married, then there's really no need for a condom or birth control and all those types of factors. So it leaves that huge part out. Uh, comprehensive sex education is more holistic. It talks about, you know, it does talks about abstinence as a method, but it's it's not the it is one of many other factors. It talks about contraceptives. It talks about how does sex factor into your lifestyle. It also talks about different types of STIs and um, so I'm sorry, I should clarify sexually transmitted diseases. And it does focus on orientations of what is your gender, what is your sexual orientation, how does that factor into your potential sexual relations. So it looks at the big picture, and obviously this can be more controversial to people who are more conservative with their sexual um, views and orientations. And we should mention that there is very little evidence that abstinence-only education does anything to reduce the amount of pregnancies or if it reduces the amount of sexually transmitted diseases, there's very little evidence that it's actually effective, where we do see a lot of evidence that comprehensive sex education does work. Anything else you want to add, Shelley? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, yeah, I would definitely say there's been quite a bit of research that having comprehensive sex education um, do actually ha has people delay having sex until later. They feel like they can you know, know what their bodies are, you know, think about their options, lower rates of teen pregnancy, and then also lower rates of STI. So there's been huge, so all the things that people, you know, like it's, it's been seen to, to have people have more control over their bodies, their reproduction. So there's been a lot of really great evidence on that. Um, and just, um, I'll mention um, about sex education in Connecticut. Um, there is only kind of two requirements for sex education in Connecticut to talk about human growth and development. So that's about, I mentioned reproductive health, so about reproductive organs, about puberty, things like that, and then disease prevention, um, which would be about STIs, um, but parents can opt out of that. So that's optional um, if parents don't want children to have that content. Um, things, um, there is not a requirement in the state of Connecticut to have comprehensive sex education. Um, that is up to individual school districts. Um, so school districts can exclude any discussion of consent. They can exclude anything on gender identity and sexual minorities, and they can include abstinence education, which is what I think I was talking about in terms of if you focus right on diseases and disease prevention, and you don't talk about consent, and you don't talk about pleasure, and you don't talk about relationships, it ends up being very focused on wait, wait, wait this is dangerous, bad things happen. And that's kind of how um, abstinence education can filter in. And it does tend to be the wealthier districts that have more comprehensive programs. Um, and so that's definitely an inequality in Connecticut. And so, um, you know, just think about what type of sex education did you receive? And I want to send, um, share two things. One is I mentioned CECUS. Um, um, they have a profile on sex education in Connecticut. Um, so you can take a look at what sex education, it was an overview of programs in Connecticut. And then um, there is through Planned Parenthood ways to advocate for a comprehensive sex education in your community if you, you're interested in doing some advocacy around increasing comprehensive sex education in your community. So those are linked in the presentation and also in the chat. So um, it's, you know, a lot of places, there's a lot of funding. It's much harder um, to have information about sex education. Um, there's also been increasing abortion restrictions. Um, people focus a lot on Dobbs versus Jackson in 2022. But in fact, um, Casey versus Planned Parenthood, um, the Supreme Court case in 1992, opened the door to state level abortion restrictions, basically saying that around health and safety, there could be reasonable abort, um, restrictions on abortions. And a number of states put pretty heavy restrictions on abortions, um, focusing on waiting periods. So if people traveled far, um, a lot of states didn't have many clinics or people had to go to different states. They put waiting periods from when you first got checked out to when you could have an abortion, which made it very expensive um, and, in fact, prohibitively time intensive for people to do that. Um, there were time limitations in terms of how far along people could be um, when they could have an abortion. Um, and I should just say that right now, um, over 50 percent of all abortions are medication abortions and over um, 90 percent are in the first trimester. So under the um, before four 
14 weeks. And so um, this is not necessarily the majority of abortions, um, but you know, it absolutely limited people's ability. And there's also been more recent surgical center requirements where people have to, um, if you're a provider, um, an obstetrician, um, you have to um, have surgical privileges at a hospital. Um, but um, a lot of hospitals don't want to give surgical privileges. It's not really necessarily necessary, um, but it made it so that a lot of clinics had to close because they didn't, they couldn't get surgical privileges anywhere. And so there were all these restrictions. And then the Dobbs versus Jackson Women Health Organization in 2020 um, basically ended federal protection of abortions. Um, and so it was up to states. And there were a lot of state level bans, the trigger bans people talked about that had basically in state law that abortions would be um, unstate constitutional um, at the or illegal with state law um, at the when Roe versus Wade was overturned. Um, there are some that have since voted on abortion restrictions. Some have exemptions for rape, incest, or the health of the mother. But what's been found is that a number of providers, especially for the health of the, the mother, um, that um, their uh, providers are afraid um, to offer abortions too early. And so they're letting, if they know there's going to be a health complication, they're waiting until the third trimester when it becomes much more health risky. Um, and in fact, um, people are afraid to use some of these exemptions um, for fear of legal. So they may exist, but they're not being used as much as they could. And so um, this is a state level map of um, in 2023, the current state of abortions, the dark red um, are where abortion is illegal. Um, the lighter red is hostile. Um, the few orange states are un uh, they're not protected, but not restricted. Um, the yellow states are protected and the um, teal states have expanded access. And some of those are expanding access because of the flood of people from other states um, and the desire to provide um, prescriptions for medication abortions through, through telehealth and things like that. So trying to protect providers and people receiving services. Um, I also um, wanted to share that there is, um, so this is state level map that I'll share and some data on who actually receives abortion, what that actually looks like. As I mentioned, some of the data on, you know, who are the women? What are they receiving? Um, there's been a real shift in the last 10 years um, because people have more information or getting abortions earlier. Um, and most of it is medication and there's just been this shift in that trend. So I think that's gonna continue to increase. So as there have been restrictions on abortion access, um, discussions about restrictions on contraceptive access, there's been a growth of something um, called crisis pregnancy centers. Um, and they're in Northeastern Connecticut. Uh, the Women's Health Center of Eastern Connecticut is in downtown Willimantic. Um, they're all over. Um, and this has been kind of, uh, as there have been restrictions on abortion, restrictions on contraception in some places, there's been um, a growth of crisis pregnancy centers. Um, these places are generally non-medical, but they'll offer pregnancy tests and options counseling, often with options that only relate to birth um, for people that are pregnant, but they say they offer all options. Um, sometimes they'll do um, ultrasounds, but they either have no or highly limited medical staff. Um, there's about 3,000 of these crisis pregnancy centers currently in the United States, and they outnumber actual women's health clinics three to one. So these are non-medical, um, but they've been funded very heavily, especially in places that have limited abortion access. So at the same time, um, that these are growing, for example, Planned Parenthood and Danielson closed during the pandemic and actually two or three Planned Parenthoods closed um, due to funding issues um, during the pandemic. So there's been contractions in women's health centers um, and growth of these crisis pregnancy centers, which is, which is troubling. And what's been found pretty widely in research is that they spread misinformation and harm. Um, so not only do they not provide medical services, um, in areas, um, especially rural areas that have shortages in medical services. Um, they can provide inaccurate um, medical information. So they may talk about the harms of abortion, um, things like uh, misinformation about cancer. Um, all of this can delay access to medical prenatal and abortion care. So what's been found is they're, um, again and again, is what they try to do is draw out appointments um, so that people get past the point where they can have abortions in different places, um, which delays prenatal care because they don't offer prenatal care and also delays access to abortions. Um, so their kind of delay tactics um, have been found to just reduce health and all of this leads to decreased maternal health. 
And so um, Connecticut in 2021 um, passed a ban on deceptive advertising that was specifically targeting women's health, um, sorry, not women's health centers, crisis pregnancy centers. Um, it hasn't been used much yet. Uh, it was actually, I think Catholic, um, Catholic charities might have sued around this. Don't, I'm not gonna say anything about this. There was a lawsuit, um, but the, the law is still standing. So it's Public Act 2117, and it specifically targets um, misinformation on billboards, on signs, things like that, to hopefully cut down on some of this. But most states don't have bans like this. Um, and so think about, is this something you, you know about? Have you seen the Women's Center of Eastern Connecticut in Willimantic or um, any other crisis pregnancy center? Um, Again, because these tend to be in downtowns, very visible, and in some cases more accessible to people, especially people walking, than actual reproductive health centers like Planned Parenthood. And I'm going to share this pregnancy center, crisis pregnancy center legislation, if anyone is interested in seeing more on it. So we have these things where it's right. It's harder to access um, comprehensive sex education, harder to access termination services, and there's a growth of misinformation and delaying from crisis pregnancy centers that outnumber reproductive health centers. What's also been happening is there's a decline in access to maternal health care. Um, as I mentioned, community um, Community health centers, like federally qualified health centers like Generations, grew out of the 1960s, um, and really that increased maternal health. Um, the pregnancy was historically very dangerous um, in terms of outcomes for both people who were pregnant and for um, fetuses and children. And so um, half of rural counties in the, the United States do not have labor and delivery services. So there's hugely limited access to labor and delivery. We're a rural county, Wyndham County, Litchfield County is also a rural county. Um, so half the rural counties don't have labor and delivery. And what's been found is time and time again that having hospital-based births um, increase um, the health of the pregnant person, the health of the newborn. So having access to hospital-based um, Delivery, labor and delivery is incredibly important, but there are claims from hospital organizations that it's too expensive because not enough births happen, that they have staffing shortages, they can't find enough um, obstetricians and nurses, and that there are safety concerns because the shortages that I just mentioned. And so in Connecticut, there have been recent Connecticut hospitals suspending labor and delivery services in three rural counties. Um, Wyndham Hospital suspended service in Wyndham County, Sharon Hospital in Litchfield County, which closed the only Litchfield County labor and delivery service, and then Johnson and Memorial Hospital in Tolland County. And so um, Connecticut's sole rural labor and delivery service is at Day Kimball Hospital in Putnam, which is in Wyndham County. And so there's uh, right now there's been a hearing for the state of Connecticut, the certificate of need. There's discussions about restoring Wyndham Hospital's labor and delivery services, um, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, and it's a huge issue. So people are having a harder time getting access to care. And we're, we still have labor and delivery in Wyndham County. A lot of states, rural counties don't have any access. And we're a relatively small state, even though it's hard for people to access these services, it's closer than um, larger, more rural states. And so this is a real problem that's making it much harder for people to access care, um, in addition to the lack of reproductive health clinics and long, month-long waits um, for um, community health centers. Okay, so I'm going to turn things over to James, who's going to talk about the Reproductive Rights Library Guide, which tried to bring together so many of the things that we just talked about and some of these contrasting expanded rights, contractions that are leaving a lot of people vulnerable. Absolutely. Thank you, Shelley. So as uh, Shelley pointed out, we tried to condense a very, very long lib guide that took months to do into barely an hour presentation. There's a lot that we skimmed over. So if you head over to our reproductive rights library guide, we broke it off into four categories, the history of reproductive health, historically marginalized women in reproduction, abortion, the Supreme Court, and advances and challenges. And we tried our best to be as um, educational as possible, backing up as many sources as we can. And there's a lot to cover, but if you're interested in any one of these categories, I highly recommend check out the LibGuide. We can elaborate a lot more in detail as we kind of skimmed over a lot of these things.
Thanks, James. And I'll just mention that like, James did a wonderful job um, for anybody ha who has QVCC access um, to compiling books that we have on the topic of reproductive rights. We have some really wonderful podcasts. Um, there's one that I'll highly recommend um, on um, something that's lesser known in 19 the, the United States um, military used to basically fire women who were pregnant or had children, um, which is sex discrimination, right? Because that's, the military is a job and you can't have that job if you're pregnant or have had children, which is only something um, that women or people who get pregnant can do. And so um, it's discriminatory. And so that's a really powerful Supreme Court case that could have decided abortion rights, which probably would have protected them as opposed to Roe versus Wade. And that person ended up having the child and claiming that restricting her right to have a child is discrimination. So it's a discrimination right to both force somebody to not have a child to keep a job or to have a, or to have a child. So like having or not having children are both kind of limiting people's rights. Sorry, it's both those sides. Sometimes I, I trip a little bit on the words. So a lot of really nice resources. Um, this was designed both um, for students, community members to get resources, but also for people that are teaching, um, hopefully some of the podcasts, books, videos um, might be helpful as dropping content into uh, to classes. So yeah, please check that out and please let us know if you have any questions, if there's anything you'd like to see added. As a note, at the end of the presentation, I just put into the chat, we have some of the references that were cited throughout the presentation. I would highly recommend um, The War Against the Weak, um, which is just an absolutely fascinating read, which the first edition of it I read when I was in college and it just like blew my mind. There's also article and versions of it, but a really fascinating historical look into the history of eugenics in this country. Okay, um, so thank you again. Um, Please reach out with any questions, and I hope that um, this kind of inspires you to do some more um, researching and advocacy.